Good afternoon, everybody. I hope that uh, you enjoyed lunch and that uh, the networking, it sounds like, has continued um, throughout the, the lunch hour and a half. Uh, we want to welcome you back uh, to this afternoon's uh, session. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Ernesto Mendez, who is an associate professor of agroecology uh, within our University of Vermont environmental program, as well as the Department of Plant and Soil Science. His research and teaching focus on agroecology, food systems, participatory action research, and transdisciplinary reach research approaches. Um, he is an active member of the Food Systems Initiative and uh, a fellow with the Gund Institute for Ecological Economics. He has more than 15 years of experience doing research and development work with small land smallholder farmers in Latin America with an emphasis on the coffee farm cooperatives. As with Amy this morning, this goes on and on, Ernesto, and uh, just let, let it be known that he's an excellent faculty member and a great scholar. And with that, I'm going to have Ernesto come up to introduce our next speaker. As you can see, I'm rather informal, so. Thank you, Doug. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here at the Food Systems Summit at UVM. It is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague and fellow agroecologist, Dr. Yahi Chappelle. Yahi is currently an incoming senior research fellow on agroecology and agriculture policy at Coventry University Center for Agroecology, Water, and Resilience. Unfortunately, this is in the United Kingdom. So I am sad about this because he's going farther away from us. Um, but I'm also excited because maybe this will be a good way to strengthen our links on food systems and agroecology work across the Atlantic. Previously, Yahi was a senior staff scientist at the Minneapolis-based um, Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, IATP, where he provided scientific input to all of its programs. Before IATP, he was assistant professor of environmental science and justice as well as Associate Director of the Center for Social and Environmental Justice at Washington State University. Yahi has also served as a consultant for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the city of Belo Horizonte in Brazil, and La Via Campesina. He holds a PhD in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology from the University of Michigan, where he worked <clears throat> excuse me, with renowned agroecologists John van der Meer and Yvette Perfecto. His first book, titled Beginning, Beginning to End Hunger, focuses on the innovative food security policies of Belo Horizonte, Brazil, and will be published next year out of University of California Press. Yahi's research in political agroecology combines conservation biology, political ecology, political economy, as well as science and technology studies. This highly transdisciplinary approach seeks to create a unique understanding of the stakes and opportunities within our contemporary food systems. He is a leading scholar of the food security policies of the city of Belo Horizonte, um, which has served as a basis for Brazil's acclaimed zero hunger pro programs. The underlying purpose of his work has been and continues to be the construction of a participatory, socially just, ecologically sustainable food system that serves both farmers and citizens and not just consumers. So with this, I would like you to help me welcome Yahi Chappell. Yahi. Thank you. <laughs> Someone has an appointment to make, I think. Uh, so I guess we're loading my presentation. Lots of jokes, but they're all scripted. <laughs> You're usually the, the man for that, Doug. You have any suggestions? Any good knock knock agroecology jokes? <laughs> Ernesto, maybe? <laughs> right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, great. 
Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you, Ernesto, for that introduction. And thank you all for uh, having me here. It's exciting. I've actually been wanting to come to uh, one of the uh, University of Vermont Food Summit, well, since you started having them. And uh, I'm glad by talking, I finally got a chance to, uh, to come here. So my talk, uh, as you might have seen from the, uh, the program, is Political Economies of Good Food. And the subtitle, oh, this is not connected to that. That's a different, there we go. Uh, and so the subtitle of my talk uh, is based on a quote from a friend of mine, Maria Whitaker, a uh, lawyer, activist, and food sovereignty advocate, who pointed out in a blog a couple years ago that sustainability without justice is simply sustained injustice. And so though we were, we were talking a little bit earlier, I guess uh, just food was uh, the theme recently, and this is good food, uh, they're not really clearly separated in my mind. So uh, based on my own career and interest, this is going to be about sustainability and justice, which together tie together to really make what I think about good food. So when I was preparing this talk, uh, and I saw in the program, I knew I was asked to talk about what makes food good, but I hadn't seen the subtitle or super title, I suppose, uh, The Necessary Revolution, Evolution for Sustainable Food Systems. And so this is actually perfect for my presentation because the big picture of my talk is the conclusion that we can't have good food without this necessary evolution and revolution, not just in our food systems, but really in our larger socio-political systems. And in, in many ways, my whole career to date is the progressive realization of, of that dynamic, maybe with the addition of one extra step that I didn't start at good food or even food or even just sustainability. I started with conservation biology was really my initial interest. And thinking about the significant threats to uh, Earth's biodiversity, which is being lost at a rate usually estimated to be several hundred times the, the background rate, uh, I quickly led me to focus on agriculture, being that it's one of the most fundamental ways that we interact with the non-human environment, and also the human environment in many ways. And uh, it not only represents us taking in the environment to our own bodies and making it ourselves, but also uh, somewhat more prosaically, it's around 40% of the Earth's non-ice-covered land. So it's a hugely significant land use. And this is increasingly being realized and talked about. And uh, so the issues around that, especially with uh, regards to land use change, which is a major driver of biodiversity loss and also a major driver of climate change, uh, food and agriculture has become more and more a, a centerpiece of a lot of conversations around sustainability. And so coming to that and thinking about that with that realization, it sort of surprised me to learn as I started out in my work that we already grow enough food to feed not just the current population, but actually 10 billion. Uh, the average calories per person per day coming into each household uh, after conversion to livestock and after wastage is around 2,800 calories per person per day. But that's after those things. If you take into account what's coming off the fields, the uh, estimate is that we have around 4,000 or 5,000 calories per person per day that, that we harvest. And so in that context, it seems somewhat bizarre to think of, okay, we were food limited, and we really could feed 10 billion people with that amount of food, not without changes, not without sacrifice, but I feel like no matter what we do to change things, we're going to have to have some kind of sacrifice somewhere. So uh, while it's not clear that it's easy, it's not clear to me that it's impossible or not one of the avenues to pursue. But very commonly in this conversation, whether you're talking about food security or you're talking about the environment, what you hear is uh, the emphasis on yield and productivity. And so we learned that supposedly the Green Revolution spared 18 to 27 million uh, hectares of land from being bought, brought into agriculture production. We have from uh, National Geographic a couple years ago, John Foley pointing out that to feed 35% more people will have to double crop production, which think about that for a second. Uh, and we have uh, this whole body of thought that's developed now called land sparing versus land sharing. Uh, how can higher yield farming help spare land? So the idea is if we increase productivity on some land, then we'll be able to spare other land for conservation. And that's more or less where that number on Green Revolution came from, saying that dynamic maybe already happened. So in this way, it begins to sound like uh, yield and productivity is sort of the Swiss army knife of good food. Producing more food is good food, and good food is more food. Or if you're slightly more geeky, maybe the, the sonic screwdriver of food. <laughs> but uh, to maybe take a little bit more serious analysis of it, uh, the late, great uh, rural sociologist Fred Buttle talked about what he called the ide ideology of productivism, 
or doctrine of productivism, describing it as a doctrine that increased production is intrinsically socially desirable and that all parties benefit from increased output. He pointed out that there is a powerful coalition that backs this idea that's based on agreement among commodity groups, land grant administrators, agribusiness firms, and federal agencies that the underlying goal of research in particular is to increase agricultural productivity. And this framework, this doctrine, emphasizes collective benefits, downplays costs and inequality, and usually uh, seeks to substitute modernization for populist or socialist tendencies that even the name Green Revolution comes explicitly from uh, a US government official contrasting it to the Red Revolutions, that there were countries that were going communist, going socialist, redistributing land, and so a Green Revolution producing more bounty would stop people from feeling like they had to change their political system, they just could have more and we would quell that. Uh, as well as actually arguably quelling some of the populist tendencies within United States farmers. Uh, so there's, there's definitely an ideology behind this, even if we're not necessarily aware of it day to day. He points out that productionist ideology was particularly effective at providing a shared sense of purpose. Uh, in addition to those, those groups I mentioned already, uh, the public agriculture research community, but also agro-industry, not just agro-input and agro-output, but also banks, major farm organizations, especially commodity organizations, federal agencies, and uh, he points out that even though he argues it wasn't meant to necessarily benefit the average farmer, it was pitched as benefiting the average farmer. So hearing about it and thinking about it this way and even just seeing the actual established research talking about all the benefits of, of production and producing more and yield, I, I sometimes think about the, the work of another doctor and I feel like <laughs> one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, from here to there, and from there to here and here to there, increasing yield is good for everywhere. And so implicitly, it seems like there's the assumption that we can find win-wins, and those are great, you know, everyone's better off. Uh, it seems to me there's often trade-offs in the real world, and I actually don't think that we can't have win-wins, but I think that we actually might have to have win-win loses, in that I think society can win, the environment can win, but increased profits are gonna to have to lose. Not zero profits, but increased profits. The level of profits we make right now, and I think that's actually one of the sacrifices that we don't talk about, but it would actually be better for most of us. But so, let's take a step back maybe and think about, think about this um, a little bit more abstractly, <laughs> or uh, from first premises maybe. And so, in terms of production, actually, I'm legally required here to say that productivity is not useless, it's not never necessary. There's times when it might be useful, there's times when it might be uh, uh, important. My argument is that it's not all times and that actually you can't leave aside the social issues. So the, the idea, no intensification without representation, that you have to have the sociopolitical issues, democracy behind it to really make it effective. But so let, let's take a step back farther and, and think about when we talk about good food then, if we're not talking about just more food, I think we should ask good food for who? good food for what, and once these really easy topics are covered, how do we do good food? And I think, I think without asking these kinds of questions, we risk you know, violating that, that, that title, and to alter Maria's statement, we risk, uh, if we fo focus first on producing more, we risk the first thing we produce being more injustice. So food, good food, good for who? A lot of my work is focused on the food insecure, those who don't currently have enough and access to enough and the right kinds of food. So obviously that's not the only group that one could think about good food for, but it's, it's the one that I tend to start with. And if we think about what is good food for those who are food insecure, or how might they get access to good food, one thing that's interesting and more or less immediately clear from 35 years of research is that hunger and starvation currently is very rarely the result of insufficient food availability, but usually the result of inability to access food with poverty being the primary reason. And Amartya Sen is a Nobel Prize uh, winning economist that pointed this out in a book length uh, examination, but it's not just Sen 35 years ago. There's plenty of research since then. Uh, so in 1995, Lisa Smith and Lawrence Haddad pointed out that 80% of malnourished children lived in countries with food energy surpluses. If we think at sort of one end of the spectrum in the United States, the average da daily per capita intake into each household is 3,800 calories per person per day. 
At the same time, we have 12 to 13 percent of Americans who can't fulfill their daily minimum food requirements without making some important sacrifices. We don't necessarily have people starving on the streets, though it's not that that never happens in the United States, but we have choices between should I buy better food or should I buy my medicine? Should I fix my car so I can go to work or should I get food for my family? Should I eat more or should my kids eat more? And so I posit that if we have almost 4,000 calories per person per day available, those kinds of choices should not be in the offing. And then uh, thinking of a country that does face huge food insecurity problems in a very acute uh, way, India, which is often viewed as a Green Revolution success story and does have over 2,500 calories per person per day produced, nonetheless has the highest prevalence of underweight children in the world. And throughout India, being a, a large and populous country, there are as many hungry people as basically the entire continent of Africa. And I think it's important to consider here why I would say, at least in my experience, Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, gets so much attention. There are vital and immense important problems there. There are an immense number of hungry people, but also Africa is a place where the productionist ideology still fits much more easily than in India. There are places that don't produce as much as they theoretically could. And so I feel like there's really a, a reason for the focus on Africa because the story in India is so much more complicated. Who wants complexity? <laughs> so I know you're sitting there thinking, Mr. Know-it-all, I hear what you're saying. This is through the magic of rhetorical devices. If producing more food is not necessarily how we do good food for fighting hunger, then what is good for fighting hunger? And I'm so glad I'm forcing you to pretend that you've asked. So this actually has been researched. Uh, Lisa Smith and Lawrence Haddad in 2015 produced uh, a paper on how hunger has been fought between 1970 and 2010, which is actually a follow-up to a paper they wrote in 2000. And if we look, hey, yes, we do have productivity on there. Is this a laser? Yeah. We do have dietary energy supply. Oops. Dietary energy supply there. And so around 20% of the decrease in child stunting, which was their indicator since we have sort of the most reliable historical data on that, 20% of the decrease between 1970 and 2000 was because of increases in uh, food availability. But I hope you'll join me in the understanding that 20% is less than 80%. And so we have other factors like safe water, sanitation, female secondary school enrollment, uh, gender life expectancy, and dietary uh, energy from non-staples, so dietary diversity more or less. And those things take up the other 80%, and actually several of them are larger slices of the pie than productivity. Now, so I, I would argue that's how we have fought hunger. It has not been exclusively or even mainly through productivity increases. Now, I hear very often, well, okay, fine, maybe I'll grant that, but what do we do if we, when we have mil billions more people? When we hit 2050 and we have 9 billion, 10 billion more people. Uh, so first, I would say in another legally mandated notice, my Friend Anne Larimore, a professor emerita at University of Michigan, points out and in a comment very parallel to Maria's, if we just assume the 9 to 10 billion people, then we are assuming continued injustice for billions of women. We're just assuming that because as women get more equality, they tend to have less children. And so just assuming 9 billion because it's a projection actually is assuming continued injustice. So that's the first thing, that we can't just go blithely on and have that number and pretend it's apolitical. But even more specifically, Smith and Haddad did look at, well, what are the projected levers for further decreasing hunger in the future? And they found, indeed, productivity is still on there, uh, per capita dietary energy supply, but it is in the lower three of the six factors that they looked at. In terms of bang per buck, in terms of the return for how much you change the indicator in positive direction, how much return do you get on decreasing stunting, they found actually that dietary energy from non-staples, so dietary diversity, was the strongest lever we have access to sanitation. Female secondary school enrollment is also very powerful. And so we see that there are still factors that are very important that are not uh, production. Which again is not to say that production is not important, but I would argue maybe as a first approximation, we should think of it proportionally to its contribution to de uh, decreases in hunger. So a paper that is coming out in bioscience by uh, Megan Schapansky and some colleagues of ours that uh, I was one of the authors, we look at publications on food security and food systems and how many of them also mention gender equity or justice. So that doesn't necessarily encompass all the previous factors, but I hope you'll agree with me that it encompasses some of that in terms of access to sanitation, human rights, equity and justice, and certainly gender. And so we found that less than 6% of 
all the papers we could find on ISI Web of Science on food security and food systems mentioned anything with gender equity or justice. And actually, if you see medical science here, it's nearly 50%, but that's almost always as a biological category saying, you know, the gender of our, our participants were male and female. So I would say less than 6% is not an accurate portrayal of what we know already from evidence base, uh, as much as we might question as evidence, importantly, in STS. But what we know currently seems to be that we should pay a lot more attention to those other factors. So to, to belabor this for a second, if we go back to this and this, uh, this powerful lever from dietary diversity, it, it's interesting to sort of a separate line of evidence if we want to look at this chart. So I apologize, there's tons going on here, but I want you to focus first on this heading. So this is from economist uh, Derek Hetty and Olivier Ecker. So we're looking at usefulness of indicators in terms of how can we know how many hungry or malnourished or food insecure are there. And so they looked at four possible indicators, calorie availability, poverty, dietary diversity, and sort of self-reported or interview-based uh, reports of food insecurity. And you can see at the bottom here, just looking at all the possible standards they have for, oops, standards they have for how you might assess it, they found calorie availability to be tied for last in terms of its usefulness as an indicator, and dietary diversity to be a clear winner. And what's interesting is they found, you know, they put, did a pretty thorough, um, thorough exploration of this. And they found that dietary diversity correlates pretty well with caloric intake, actually. As it increases, you tend to also have calorie intake getting better. So it actually sort of serves as a twofer, whereas calorie availability does not reflect dietary diversity. So there's a lot of actually interesting reasons to pay attention and maybe even favor diversity when we think about food insecurity and, and good food. So good for who? So I've talked about the food insecure of the world to, to summarize. We've seen dietary diversity is really important in the context of improving basic rights, improved sanitation, clean water, education, especially as pertains to educational parity for women and girls, and more broadly, gender explicit and gender empowering approaches. So there's a lot of elements here. I, I would say that you can't do any of these just in the abstract or alone. Just like productivity, it has to be done in the context that is in communication with society, communication with specific communities, with democratic consent. You can't just throw something at it and have it solve it. And I would say that's probably equally true with secondary school enrollment as productivity. So I'm not advocating doing anything blindly, but I'm least of all advocating doing productivity blindly. And uh, this, some of this might be familiar since I think Raj Patel was a keynote speaker last year. And he talked a good bit, a good bit about gender, I understand, and, and some about uh, the work of Rachel Besner Kerr here, who's uh, with two of her colleagues, Liz Lizzie Shumba and Esther uh, Lupafia in Malawi. And she's worked in Malawi for quite some time. I think Raj has joined her on some of the work. Uh, they talked about their work with gender and participatory agricultural development, biodiversity, agroecology. And one of the things that they've done that's actually a really important addition to thinking about gender and women is the fact that they also worked with the men. Empowering women is not just about lifting women up, but also about reconsidering the relationships men and women have. And so in uh, one of their projects, I believe they had you know, recipe contests for the men. The men got to sort of think about and realize a little bit more what it was like to have some of the duties that the women had. And uh, I was at a conference in Mexico where we were talking about expanding it's kind of the freedom of men, really, the, the freedom of expression that you can do more kinds of roles, that there's not just one male role. You know, not everyone's excited about that, but that's part of the conversation about changing the relationship men have to different kinds of work and their identity, as well as empowering women and girls and the kind of identity that they're allowed or encouraged or restricted to having. And just on the, the empirical side, uh, they actually have found, uh, from Rachel's work, increases in child nutrition, uh, decreases in childhood stunting, increases in uh, biodiversity, some possible indications of increased soil fertility from the agroecological methods they're using, which are um, uh, green manure, and uh, improved stability of food supply. So sometimes when I talk about these issues, my background is in ecology, as, as Ernesto uh, mentioned, and I talk about this with my natural science colleagues, and sometimes they, they say, well, okay, you know, that, that all uh, makes sense, uh, but you know, gender is hard. You know, how are we gonna do something about gender? Like that's just complicated identities and social issues and it's really messy. And that's true, um, but so I, I might maybe start with what's out there. So one of my colleagues at my former institute, um, ITP, wrote about the Tamil Nadu Women's Collective in India and their work with agroecology and climate smart agriculture. 
and as well as a suite of programs helping women. So they had uh, workshops on how to prevent abuse, how to recognize and report abuse, as well as empowerment and alternative agricultural methods. The Institute for Development Studies in England has published a variety of articles on gender from Colombia, India, uh, an advice guide for donors, and actually, a, a, I would say, a, a really good uh, annotated bibliography for gender and economic empowerment. Uh, although it's around eight years old, I would say it's actually a really solid bibliography uh, if you want to look at some of the extended research in this area. Uh, it's also, I think, very important to mention that La Via Campesina, the International Peasant Farmers Movement, which has uh, members in more than 75 countries, uh, women and gender equality is one of their top issues. Uh, I would say it's actually become relatively foundational, though, um, as I wrote about in a chapter a couple years ago, there are some tensions there, and even Via Campesina, everyone I've talked to there agrees that they're not doing well enough. But I think, interestingly, they're probably doing a lot more than usual. So they're sort of stuck in between really far from how much we should be doing, but doing a lot more than, than is normal. And uh, the noted development economist, Bina Agarwal, also wrote in the same text about uh, food security, productivity, and gender equality, that insofar as we are concerned about productivity, and sometimes in some places that increasing the access of women, the quality of access to education, to agricultural inputs, to secure land title, to political rights, increases the productivity of women, and so that could probably feed, they estimate, millions of people more if women simply were uh, closer to equality. So when I hear my colleagues say, well, we're not sure what to do about gender, I, sometimes I, I, I feel like this quote from uh, Bertrand Russell that Aristotle could have been cured of thinking that men had more teeth than women, which he thought by asking Mrs. Aristotle to open her mouth. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's out there. <laughs> so, good food for who? So I've talked a lot about the food insecure of the world, but also uh, everyone. I, I think you know, dietary diversity is certainly something that pretty much everyone could benefit from, and a thoughtful approach to political economy, to our sociopolitical relationships, I would say is good sort of everywhere for everyone. And we might actually take advice from Bertrand Russell and use the simple device of asking them, uh, in that I don't think there's any one definition of good food, no matter how much we wordsmith it, there's not one that's gonna work everywhere for everyone at all times. And so I think it always has to be developed in its details with a specific group in a specific place. And so thinking about this, uh, I thought of actually a lesson from a diversity training I had in my previous life as an engineer, and we had this person start the day with the golden rule is wrong. And uh, you might say maybe at least it's incomplete, because the golden rule, do unto others as you'd want to be done unto, assumes that others want to be treated the same way that you want to be treated. And they might not, they might want to be treated differently. So again, maybe the simple device of asking them how they want to be treated and having that conversation, or with regards to good food, you know, don't work for access to what is good to you, but rather what is good to them or us, to whatever community you're in. But okay, if we're talking about individual preferences, and those vary, you can't just assume everyone's preferences are the same, well, hey, that's what markets do, right? So we can just let it to the market, because markets aggregate preferences. Well, so no, uh, kind of. I mean, there's really important functions of markets. Markets are really powerful. Markets are going to be part of what we're doing. But uh, one of the many points one could make in terms of the limits of markets with regards to good food, uh, you could take from Perón Shalizi, uh, uh, economist and a statistician, who have pointed out in a series of works they're working on what they call cognitive democracy, cognitive democracy and that uh, basically prices, one number, you're losing information, no matter what you do. If you have a multi-factorial, multi-variable system and you reduce it down to one number, you can only transmit so much information through, through one number. And so you're losing an immense amount of important information. So yes, prices aggregate preferences in a way, but not in any complex way. And so we can't just pile it onto a thermometer and have a thermometer between bad food and good food and call it done. So markets, you know, important, they'll be part of it, but they can't do it alone. They can't be depended on to aggregate preferences for good food because it's just not capable of doing that through the mechanism uh, through which it works. Okay, so that's the simple answer, I'm sure, to uh, good for who. So food that's good for what? So one answer uh, that we saw in some of the articles that I, I uh, showed earlier is stopping land use change, which for my original interest, conservation biology, is one of the foremost threats to, to conservation of, uh, of biodiversity. But if we look to those ideas in those papers in the beginning about yield of productivity, 
And then we look at the actual research on land use. Uh, this is from a paper by Carl Heinz Urban colleagues in 2013. And they say, actually, given the complexity, having some single indicator, or sorry, simplified amount of eventual hypotheses uh, on land use, they just can't be supported. You can't just draw yield to land needed or land used. And indeed, simple causal relationships between the individual processes uh, that might go into land use, the driver that impacts land intensification can't be established. It's more complicated than that. So this is actually from a paper a decade before, but uh, from the noted geographer Eric Lambin and, uh, and colleagues. And so this is one of their many empirical, empirical investigations of what actually drives land use change. And so if we look just at agricultural expansion there, you could put yield increases in maybe economic factors or technological factors if you wished, either one. But either way, you see that there's a lot of other dynamics going on, a lot of other things influencing agricultural expansion, which is basically what uh, Urb et al. said. So to me, it comes to being a very big problem when you look at, for example, the work from the Cambridge group with Ben Fallon and other colleagues saying, OK, well, this is the area at stake in terms of how much food we need to produce. And if we can produce more and less land, then we can reduce it by that much. I mean, what is this other than a monocausal explanation? And so part of my argument is not, again, that production has nothing to do with it, but my continued argument with, with Ben Fallon and his other colleagues is putting all the sociopolitical in the first paragraph and last paragraph of your paper is wildly insufficient. And so we can't just sort of decide that we're going to reduce that to this and have a caveat or a footnote and, and call that really a rational approach to it. Yes, ah, yeah. So now you're thinking, OK, fine, tough guy in this rhetorical device. Then what do we do about land use change? And actually, an interesting piece of re uh, recent research by Oldekop and colleagues uh, found that positive conservation outcomes were strongly associated with the protected areas that had co-management, that worked with local, uh, local people, that explicitly integrated local people as stakeholders, uh, that, had, that addressed uh, economic inequalities, empowered local people, and maintained local and livelihood benefits. And that's much more likely to lead to not just enhanced socioeconomic outcomes, but also enhanced conservation outcomes. And uh, there's also actually another interesting paper by uh, Sheba and Mustalati from, uh, I think, last year about expert knowledge in Tanzania. And they found, actually, that forest conservation in Tanzania was significantly hampered by the disproportionate power had by experts. There was not enough power in the, in the community Experts in terms of government agents and researchers had too much say, and that actually was hampering the ability to have positive conservation outcomes. So what about climate change then? Well, so for one thing, obviously, as, as you might know already, or as I mentioned before, land use change is a major driver of climate change. But also when we're thinking about this, when we're thinking about food, we should, I think, think about distributional inefficiency. So for one example, Besides the fact that we have 2,800 calories per person per day after waste and livestock and still not everyone has food, uh, the USDA calculates what they call nutrition gaps and distribution gaps, with nutrition gap being how much grain we need just to get to the total number of calories someone in a region needs, which, as we've seen with dietary diversity, calories is not enough by itself, but you know, for this purpose, it's an interesting number. But the distribution gap we need for everyone to get access to that food, assuming current inequalities. And so for Latin America, that amount is five times larger than the nutrition gap. And so it just doesn't make sense to me to continue on our problems and ignore the part that makes it five times harder because that part is hard. Producing five times as much as we need to is also hard. So it seems to me that that's something that should be, again, it's not, not that people never mention it, but this can't just be in the last paragraph as like someone else should do it. And then also there's the issue of food waste, which there is the documentary we saw last night. Um, it's becoming much more in the public eye, which is I think a really important and, and good contribution. Uh, it's estimated to be around 30% of food worldwide, uh, with some differences between developing and developed countries. And actually, last night, they, I, th I think they had the very good admi admonition that we shouldn't call it food waste, but wasted food, because it's not scraps. This is food that could be eaten very often that is uh, then being thrown away. And in terms of climate change, this is important, because if uh, wasted food was uh, a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases right now, after USA and China. So dealing with it does have you know, a very significant importance. But to say it maybe a little bit more uh, uh, simply or, or sillily, if we're worried about housing, and we're trying to build enough houses for everyone, and 
two or three of every six houses we built burned down, I don't think we say, well, we need to make more houses faster. You don't, yeah, you, just, you don't throw away your car because you get a flat tire. So I think the scale of waste in terms of the things we need to worry about, again, is just out of proportion, not significantly proportioned to its actual uh, uh, impact. An interesting thing about this that I was discussing with, with Charlotte, the uh, keynote speaker this morning, is that in a way I think our efforts right now with waste can only succeed insofar as they don't succeed because if they really do work, at some point that means we're going to have to sell less stuff. If we stop food waste and we're still selling as much food, then I guess we're all eating it and just expanding. Uh, so at some point there has to be some kind of limit or ceiling or sense of enoughness. And that's another one of those really complicated, tricky, tricky questions, but it's one that if we don't address, it doesn't make sense to address food waste. It has to be paired with selling less food at some point by some groups. And so this is part of the conversation that I think is important and difficult. And I'm all for cooperating with private interests, with talking across different lines, but I also think that certain realities should be faced, and this is one of them. And I think the idea that there can be profits, but not maybe a certain level of profits, is an important idea that we don't speak of enough. And so essentially you end up with the same kind of complex problems that you see when you try and do anything that's redistributive or justice-based, that some people might be winners and some people might be losers compared to their current situation. But we need to do that. No matter what our approach is to good food for everyone, we need to have these conversations. There's no way of getting around it. There's no technical solution that avoids that. And so whether you're looking at food waste, food production, or gender empowerment, you need to look at how we're going to evolve and even maybe have a revolution in our food systems. So good for what, good for who, got those down. How do we do good food? So I've partially answered uh, uh, my opinion on this, which is that good food must be done in and with communities in situated contexts. Uh, that is a really important aspect of making it effective, making it stick, making it change, making it work. And so a really key tool in this is action and participatory based research. So I would say, uh, being someone who's returning to academia now, and, and many of us here being in academia in some form, one of the challenges that I put to, to all of us, myself included, is to really fight for action and participatory research to be recognized as fully valid, as important as any other work. Otherwise, we're not gonna get it done. It does us no good to have research that is never, ever implemented. And action and participatory research actually shows that it can get implemented. And actually, the point of action research is defined by its creator, Kurt Lewin, as research leading to action. So our research, if our research is not leading to action, I say we're doing it wrong. And so we need to challenge that to be a really equally valid track, having work actually be put into practice in the world, being valued, the same as work that is maybe more uh, uh, abstract or not as applied. Not that we shouldn't value that too, but that they should be equally valued at the very least. And you should be able to be rewarded within institutional systems for action and participatory research as a matter of course, rather than having to fight for it. So that's all the things. Um, but uh, before I go, I've got sort of a, like a last sort of BuzzFeed uh, recommendation for good food. So one simple trick to save our food system. And uh, that's higher food prices, which I'm sure no one has any qualms about whatsoever. Uh, an interesting thing, if you start looking at, especially the current research, several mainstream economists have been saying that higher food prices actually appear to lower, lower po global poverty. Uh, so not just Ivanik and Martin, who are World Bank economists, but Derek Hetty at uh, IFPRI found robust evidence that in the long run, which is one to five years for economists apparently, which makes me really worry about the phrase in the long run, we're all dead. <laughs> but apparently in the one to five year long run, food prices reduce poverty and inequality as long as it's passed on to food producers. So again, this is not about producing more, that may happen, but this is about producers getting more for what they actually produce. And the really interesting thing is this reduces hunger and poverty in their models, well not, they did panel data, so models and empirically, macroeconomically, because as farmers get better prices at bids up wages, they're able to pay their labor more, and labor competition in the urban areas then becomes bid up as well, and so urban wages go up in a one to five year period. And they found this, I think, with 31 country was their, their panel data. Now, it is really important to note, as uh, Hetty does, that this one to five year period, if you don't want urban uh, residents and those who are net food buyers to be suffering, you do have to have some kind of program that does provide for food access in that period. 
the nice thing is there's tons of programs around the world that are finding different ways to do that, from conditional cash transfers to direct cash transfers. Uh, Brazil, where I did a lot of my research, has got a notable suite of programs on how to support food security in the interim, uh, or, or, well, more broadly, but also you can use it to support it in the interim. So there's all sorts of possible good reasons that uh, higher food prices would be a good idea. I'm not going to talk about uh, how, per se, we, we could talk about that in the panel discussion, but it's something at IVP that we've talked about for many years is supply management, which we weren't allowed to say publicly for a while, and now you kind of can in some audiences, then other ones don't know what you're talking about, so it's okay. Uh, but uh, I think what's really interesting and important is if we start saying that this might be a good thing to do, then we can think of ways to do it. We don't necessarily know how to do it uh, well at this point and with the current systems, but evolving and revol revolutionizing our system to, to do this might be a good idea. I would argue, actually, it is a good idea from another point of view, which is actually just kind of straightforward. I never quite understand when I meet certain economists why it isn't just obvious that food prices should be higher, according to economic models, because we know their externalities. Costs are not in the price. And the estimates are pretty consistent across a lot of different studies. FAO last year compiled a bunch of them and found that the externalities, the cost to natural capital, the cost to environment, was between 130 and 170 percent of the production value of the food. So it just doesn't make any sense to me, at least from the straight economic point of view, to say, well, we should just not have that in the price. Because we're still paying it, either with our health, with environmental health, through our taxes. So again, you know, if, we did, if we did that, if it was in the prices, we would have to look at sociopolitical issues. We'd have to look at equality, access. We have to make sure people are still able to get access to food. It's not simple. But it also might be a good tool to have and, and to consider how we might do it. It's also arguably one very logical approach to the food waste in that things that are more expensive, people are less likely to waste. Like I said, you don't throw away your car because it gets a flat tire. So again, not that it has no impacts. There are equality and distribution impacts, but maybe those are problems we should deal with in this larger context because one way you get people to waste less things is it costs more. You're not going to waste it, perhaps. And it's actually a really, again, incredibly logical approach to expensive diets. I, 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 so, you know, more meat-eating diets. People eating, over consumer are eating more meat, meat that's very costly to the environment. And I really don't get it sometimes when I talk to certain economists, who shall remain nameless, who, you know, they push back on that. They say, well, what about, you know, justice? You know, some people deserve to eat more food and aren't having enough meat, which, yeah, I, I, I could accept that. Uh, I know some people might debate how much meat do we need, but I accept that some people probably should have access to more protein. But since when do economists bring justice in as their first defense? Uh, not that you shouldn't be concerned with it, but why does this come up now? You should say, well, this is the reality. So if the reality is that there's these costs that aren't in the price, I would think the first economic impulse would be, yeah, well, the cost should be in the price, and then we can think about distribution. And I don't want to make light of the fact that that's all very complicated, but again, there's a certain intuition and logic to it that makes sense in terms of having the prices reflect the costs, and then trying to figure out how we uh, 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 make sure everyone still has access, which actually, I think, um, having worked the past three years in the U.S. food movement, U.S. food sovereignty movement, there's a huge potential at this juncture that we're not talking nearly enough about uh, so far in any, any of the circles I've been in, academic circles or NGO circles, in terms of uh, we have right now this pretty vibrant fight for 15, and there has been for, for, for increasing minimum wage, and there has been, many researchers have pointed out, an implicit deal, more or less, that the United States will keep food prices down and will keep wages stagnant. Cheap food can go along with we don't pay you very much. And so it seems to me right now there's a huge opportunity for a new kind of conversation between urban and rural residents, between farmers and producers and eaters to say, well, we should sign on for you having higher wages in urban areas, and you should sign on, sign on for us having higher wages, higher prices in rural areas. You can afford the food, and we can afford to live and pay our labor more. So it seems to me, again, not an easy conversation, but one that we could be having that would deal with some of the complexities maybe in a, a, you know, a reasonable way. So to conclude, almost, I actually have two more slides, but to uh, start to conclude, uh, I want to quote Martin Luther King Jr. that talking about power and justice, that power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the, man, the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power, cor power correcting everything that stands against love. So we might expand that or, or change that. You know, it's always wise to mess with the words of Martin Luther King. Uh, 
we might maybe for good food say that in terms of good food, agriculture and food without love is reckless and abusive, and good food without justice is sentimental and anemic. That good food is implemented with respect for the demands of justice and supports the power of all people to, connect, to correct everything that mitigates against love. And I haven't talked at all about localism, which is actually a topic I have a lot of interest in, but I would point out quickly here that I think actually there's a very strong direct parallels between uh, love and food. And actually, uh, I was talking earlier with one of my colleagues, Ginger Nickerson, and, and uh, intimacy, you could say. That love, obviously, it can go any distance. You can love someone anywhere in the world. It doesn't have to be the local. But there's something special about love that's around you, a love that's immediate. The, the difficulties, the negotiation that requires are unique, but the opportunities that love in your immediacy has are also unique. And love shouldn't only be local but there's something powerful about focusing on the local and having other long distance connections, but having the local be a focus. And so I think there's really a strong parallel between those ideas. So most people, smart people, would end their, their talk with Martin Luther King, but I'm gonna press onward. So my last, <laughs> so the last bit is actually from the geographer Jesse Rabot. And in a paper from a couple years ago on climate change and vulnerability, I think this applies to food as well though, he says, how far can a climate process be expected to go in correcting all past wrongs? These were questions from uh, one of his reviewers for his paper. And must all climate researchers also be responsible for analyzing all underlying social issues? And Rebos responded, well, my answer is yes. Any, any environmental intervention can go very far, and yes, this is our, uh, yes, this is our responsibility. Without being aware of the past, as in all areas of, of endeavor, we are likely to re reproduce and deepen past wrongs. He goes on, a grasp of the past is not optional. The kinds of institutions, processes, and forums that could enable the fundamental changes he calls for do not exist, uh, one of the reviewers further pointed out. And he responds, they do exist in some places at some times for some people. If we as analysts or activists insist on requiring that all interventions enable democracy, and we insist this demand be enforced, we may help force the hand of practice by mobilizing liability, sanction, or exposure, and shame. I do not want to act or be in a world that does not try. Democracy is an ongoing struggle. It is not a state to be arrived at. It will come and go in degrees. Trying is a struggle that produces emancipatory moments, however ephemeral they may be. The fleeting joy and creativity of freedom is worth it. And so just to conclude for real this time, I would say if we don't pay attention to Jesse Rubo's words, in everything we do, research, extension, outreach, practice, the alternative is sustaining today's injustice when we have the power to stop it. Thank you.